Jasmine, thank you very much for joining our CEO series. It's a pleasure. Pretty ambitious mission, I know, Save the Children has. What is its mission? Our mission is to inspire breakthroughs in the way that the world treats children and to deliver immediate and lasting change in their lives. So our theory of change is that we want to innovate on the ground, come up with new and better ways to help children, to take that to scale and um, to use that evidence to um, inspire much wider changes, to show what's possible, what's affordable, what's doable, um, to kind of bust the myths that uh, exist that make people think that, well, you know, it's always been like that. There's always been children going hungry. There's always been children out of school and um, we can tolerate that and that's the way it is. And the key thing is on those breakthroughs, we want to inspire those breakthroughs. So we know we won't achieve them on our own. You know, no matter how many children's lives we save directly through our programs and we save millions on the ground, um, that will still only be a drop in the bucket. We, we have to use that evidence um, to make the case, to, to push for that wider systemic change. And the role of the CEO in this, you described having a new international role. What is this role? Well, it's still kind of forming. Um, I, I don't have um, a blueprint. I'm, I'm the first international chief executive. So my first uh, task was really, as I say, to, to um, do a multi-way merger, really, of all of the Save the Children's international programs, which historically, like most organizations like Save the Children, were all formed at the beginning of the last century. And what we've all been on a journey towards over the last decade or so um, is bringing all of our work together in order to achieve more. Um, and what Save the Children decided to do uh, just a, a year or so ago was actually really bite the bullet and do that full merger of all our international programs. So that's the structure part. Have you been playing around with uh, the culture, touching that? What changes have you made? How have you made it? What we're keen to do is not just join up the parts of what was essentially a 20th century organisation, but as I say, re-establish we recreate ourselves um, as, as a 21st century organization. And therefore, we wanted to um, ask ourselves, what are the fundamental tenets of, of a 21st century organization with a, with a mission like ours? And first and foremost, it's about being a catalyst, we think. Um, and to be a catalyst, it's not just about delivering great programs on the ground, which has, you know, is our stock in trade, it's, it's what we know how to do, but it's also about being able to uh, communicate what we're doing, to learn from what we're doing um, inside the organisation, but critically with other players. We're not the only people working on these issues. So really using knowledge um, to help to create change. We have expertise in these areas, but we don't want to sit on that expertise. We want to really lever that. Um, and so creating that that culture where people um, really use that information to achieve wider change um, has been fundamental to, to, to our change program, our transformation program. You also talked about creating a new centre international organisation. How did you think about that centre? How large, how small, how did you think about who you chose for your key positions? If you close your eyes and imagine a 21st century organisation, where is the centre of that organisation? Um, and I think the answer is it isn't really in any one place. You don't imagine a great big, you know, tower block in, in New York City. You don't imagine a, a UN type structure in, in Geneva. Um, you don't actually imagine a, an office such as this in London. You know, what I env envisage is a series of, of hubs around the world. So here in London, uh, we will have a centre of a you know, billion dollar organisation from the get go, um, but even when we're at full strength, we still only want to be 100 or so people in terms of the, the, the executive centre, if you like, where, where I'll be based. Um, the, the virtual centre will be much more widely spread. The CEO in the 21st century, is it going to be a diff require different things than what it would have required 10, 20 years ago? Well, I'm not sure I'm an expert on that question, but I can certainly see that my job has changed, even in the last decade, actually, um, because it, it, my current job is sort of leadership, but without any lines. Um, sure, I've got my line management responsibility in you know, the 70 countries where we're running international programs. Um, those, those will report up in a sort of slightly more traditional way. But 
what we're trying to do even in that structure is is get the decision making much more at the, at the country level. You know, there are still these 29 different chief executives with their boards around the world who in a way own Save the Children International um, and therefore in a way um, I you know I, I need to do what they want but at the same time they've appointed me to in a leadership position that will take forward our strategy and develop our strategy and and you know set a direction for Save the Children um, and when I started out in this job I'd be sort of agonising about, well, I, I can't tell these people what to do. You know, how, how on earth am I going to, you know, set a direction or lead people in a certain direction? But then, you know, I thought about it, and actually, you know, which chief executive really, if there's any successful company, runs it by telling people what to do? You don't. You know, even if those people report into you, which in in my case, those chief executives don't, you have to, you ha you have to listen to people. You have to bring people together, you have to you know, get the buy-in, you have to get people to reach a conclusion about what the right direction is to go in. You know, you have to play a role in that as a leader, um, but it's not about telling people what to do. So as you reflect on the transformation you've helped drive over the last year or so, if someone else was about to launch that journey in their organisation, any lessons? Make sure you've done your groundwork. So make sure that, that, that you do have a critical group of critical mass, and it needn't be that large, of you know, the key players who, who, are, who are totally up for going on that journey with you. Um, and you know, really nurture and don't under, you know, underestimate the value of that grouping. Um, and then you know, bit by bit, try to broaden that out. Um, there's a lot of talk about in any change or transformation process about communication and I think we've all got that message now and we all you know know to staff and make sure that we've got good two-way communications going out but there's a there's a difference between communication and building trust and understanding um, and and I think you know don't underestimate the need to continue to foster first of all have that trust and understanding with a small group of people and then continue to foster that don't take it for granted and build out from that and, and build a wider and wider constitu group constituency for change. Jasmine, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you.